I welcome Professor Isaac and my deepest gratitude to him for agreeing for this talk. And, yes. and uh, I really feel honored to have you in this talk and coming from the background of working in Ghana and you are a faculty at the reagent uh, University College of Science and Technology yeah. and you are the founding chair for the Pan-African Vivax and Ovale Network. Exactly. And your focus, or focus of malaria work is on transmission dynamics of Vivax and P. Ovale in Africa. So yes. I think this today's work, today, your today's uh, talk in this workshop will be extremely useful to Indian malaria researchers as well because Vivax can be a big, a big uh, stumbling block for India as well because India harbors almost 50% of burden is of Vivax and okay. we are actually unaware of how much is the other burden of ovale and malaria, the neglected okay. uh, species. So uh, I really feel very heartened that this talk will be very useful to us. And Sachin, I hope this talk will be available to our uh, malariologist people across India yes. on the Mera India platform after this talk is over. So, you know, we can have access to your discussion and, and to your deeper insights about this work. Hmm. And uh, so I don't know, if, I mean, uh, uh, Indian Council of Medical Research is the uh, research organization under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for Government of India. And yeah. this uh, special program of Malaria Elimination Research Alliance is a special vehicle for funding and coordinating and steering the operational research for malaria elimination. So okay. this, this lecture series is very special to us. And we are very happy, sir, Professor Rizak, to have you here for this talk. Our yeah. honor and uh, please accept our thank you for it. And yeah, yeah thank you so thank much. You Over yes. to you, Sachin. Okay, yeah, so thanks, uh, Sachin. And I really appreciate the invitation. And I, I'm looking forward to some collaboration, you know, after you know, after the presentations going forward. Yeah. Sure, sure. So before sure, we you. begin uh, begin this today's lecture, I would like to share an important milestone we achieved. I mean, globally towards malaria emission which is the uh, WHO World Health Organization has certified Azerbaijan and uh, Tajikistan as a malaria-free countries. And Ooh. with this achievement, uh, a total of 42 countries or territories have been certified as malaria-free uh, by WHO globally. Uh, and today is the fifth talk of our lecture series. Before this talk, we heard uh, Professor, Professor Faith Osier uh, and she talked on the mechanisms of immunity uh, against malaria. Mm -hmm. uh, so today, Professor uh, uh, Isaac Quay, uh, he will uh, give us a flavor of uh, new concepts of plasmodium with respect to malaria elimination. So uh, I, would, I would like to read a few lines about his uh, uh, introduction. Uh, Professor Isaac is a faculty at Regent University, uh, Regent University of uh, College of Science and Technology at Ghana. He is the founding chair of Pan Africa Vivex Ovale Network, which collaborates with NMPs to refocus attention of emergence of P. Vivex and Ovale in Africa. He is the member of RBC ARMPC Advocacy and Resource Mobilization Partner Committee Steering Committee. Uh, he has more than 20 years of professional expertise in the field of malaria, following his postdoctoral training at, in genome sequencing at University of Washington under uh, Professor Carol Sibley. Uh, uh, during this period, he initiated the online database for anti-malaria drug resistance, which has grown into global WRWARN program. He reported the association between haptoglobin and diabetes, along with its role in HIV disease severity. This work was earned the attention of Professor Oliver, who discovered haptoglobin phenotypes and won the Nobel Prize in the area of medicine. Uh, Professor Isaac uh, was the first to report the presence of Plasmodium vivax and ovale in Nambia and Botswana. So with this brief introduction, I invite uh, Professor Isaac to uh, start his talk. Sir, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sachin, and uh, greetings to everyone who is participating in this lecture series. Um, I'm happy to be here and to share my thoughts with all of us here. So the, the topic, as you've been told, is on the current plasmodium biological concepts vis-a-vis -vis malaria elimination. So the, the basics uh, on plasmodium parasites is on starting with the taxonomy. Uh, so the domain name for these parasites is Eukaryota. And, the, and they are under the phylum Epicomplexa. 
you know, the phylum has a very special organelle called the epicoplast. And uh, this epicoplast has some organelles, the rupturis and the micronemes that the parasite uses to enter red blood cells of the hosts when they are infecting. They are under the other hemosporida, and this is characteristics of the parasites that feed on him, um, you know, of the host's cells. And the genus is Plasmodia, as, as we all know. And there are five species that infect human. We have the PV, PF, PO, and then P. nolsi, as well as P. malaria. Now, the key biological characteristics of these parasites is that they are obligate intracellular. Um, now, what this means is that they, they need to stay in a host cell in order to grow and to develop. Um, so, their life cycle is initially completed in a primary definitive host, which is, in this case, is the mosquito. And then we have the intermediary host, which is humans. Um, so the life cycle consists of the sexual and then the asexual parts. The sexual parts takes place in the mosquito and then the asexual parts in the intermediary hosts. The sexual phase of the life cycle goes through a process that is referred to as sporogony and the asexual phase goes through a cycle that is referred to as schizogony. So, now, okay, I'll go briefly through the life cycle, you know, to give our understanding of, you know, what we are going to be discussing. So, the life cycle that happens in the mosquito, that is the sporogony, starts this way, that the, the feeding mosquito picks up the gametocytes, which is male and female gametocytes, at the time of feeding. Now, this is taken into the midgut epithelium of the mosquito. Then in the midgut, there is fertilization between the male gamete and then the female gamete. Usually the male gamete undergoes what we call exflagellation, where the, you know, the, the, the DNA comes out of the cell and then fertilizes the macrogamete of the female to form a zygote in the midgut. Then the zygote develops further into an oocyst. And then this then goes through the basal lamina, which is shed into the hemolymph. And then the, the oocyst develops into the okinate. Uh, oak, the okinate then goes into the salivary gland and it's ready to be excreted, you know, during a feeding of the Anopheles mosquito. Now, in the human cycle, normally, you know, we are told, you know, in, in the books that the, the female deposits the uh, sporozoids that have been generated from sporogonin uh, into the, the blood vessels of the, of the host. But normally, um, the, in the feeding, whilst the mosquito is probing to find a vessel, the parasites are deposited under the skin. Um, and then the parasites then move through the tissues of the skin until they find a vessel and then goes through the vessel and then enters the liver, going through the, the liver copper cells until they find uh, the hepatocytes where they stay in and then develop. Um, so the, this process of going through from the deposition under the skin until the parasite finds its way in the hepatocytes is called schizogon. Um, so there are some very interesting developments here in you know, during schizogony. Once the parasite enters the liver in Plasmodium vivax and P. ovale, some of the uh, stages fail to develop further um, and they stay there in the form of hypnozoids. And these are dormant forms of P. vivax and P. ovale. Um, we are not certain yet whether there are dormant forms of the other plasmodium species, but I'll be talking about that shortly. Um, so this is the, the overall picture of how uh, the parasites are transmitted from the mosquito and then into the blood. 
Now, with this background, the question is then, so how does this life cycle fit into what we do during elimination? Now, let me just face that in an elimination, the agenda is that you have to detect the parasites and then treat the parasites that are found locally as well as the imported cases because they, the transmission burden would have de decreased significantly. Now, now, if you have to detect, then there has to be a way to be able to say that the parasite is present or not. And usually the medium of detection is the blood. So the parasites that are present in the blood during the asexual phase of schizogony is the ones that are detected, you know, and then the target is to treat these ones that are detected. Now, so in, in an elimination setting, the definition that is given is that one has to interrupt local transmission of a specified malaria parasite species in a defined geographical area. So this is delimited geographically uh, as a result of deliberate activities. Now, so you can, in a country, one can demarcate, you know, areas where transmission is low and then start elimination in those areas and then move you know, to other parts of the country. So there's delimitation, there's a, ge a geographical spatial delimitation of um, elimination uh, in, in any context, yeah. So we, we sustain elimination through two key activities. This is by surveillance, you know, to, to determine the, the, the sites or the foci of infection, and then to ensure that any imports are immediately uh, detected and targeted for treatment. Now, the, the concepts that prevail now uh, brings in a lot of uh, issues that one has to properly consider when uh, putting in operational activities to eliminate the parasites. Now, and there are two factors that I will be highlighting at this point. The first one is what I've termed a mosquito factor. And then the second one is on a parasite factor. Now, the mosquito factor is pretty simple in the sense that mosquitoes, although not, you know, properly uh, established, can move across border areas, you know. So if one country A is reaching elimination and country B hasn't really reached elimination, mosquitoes that are infected can move across the border from one country to the other and then initiate a transmission process. So it is important that, you know, surveillance is made not only on the core parasite species, but also the infected mosquitoes that move across boundaries uh, to be detected and then targeted for elimination. And then we have the parasite factors. And uh, one of the key factors I already mentioned that, you know, in P. vivax and P. ovale, uh, in the time when they, they enter the liver, cells, you know, some of these remain dominant and um, and then reactivate after a time. And these are the hypnozoids. Apart from the hypnozoids, now the current knowledge is that the liver may not be the only site where the parasites hide in a dormant state. And these other sites that are outside of the liver that has infections are called cryptic infections. And uh, I'll be talking about them shortly. So let's go back again uh, to the life cycle. So the, the mosquito cycle, we are clear in our mind. You know, you have the midgut epithelium, the, the, the zygotes, you know, going to the oocysts, then the ochinids, and then that goes through uh, the sporogonesis to generate the sporozoids in the salivary gland. And then in humans, when this has been inoculated into, the sporozoids have been inoculated into humans, you have the extra hepatic tissues, you know, which sustain the cryptic infections. And the key tissues that have been known now is the bone marrow, the spleen, the lungs, the adrenal glands, and then the placenta. Now, I mentioned previously that we know that in, in elimination, you detect and treat, and what you are detecting is what you find in the blood. Now, the infections, the cryptic infections in the bone marrow the spleen, the lungs, the adrenal glands, and placenta are not available. They are not easily detectable, you know, because, you know, it will be an invasive activity. You know, so for routine activity, you can't enter the, the liver of the spleen or bone marrow to assess, you know. So these are unavailable for detection. And because they are unavailable, they, they serve as reservoirs, you know, that sustain an infection. 
Um, and we also know that at the time when the sporozoites are inoculated, they don't, they don't just enter the, the, the liver tissue just through the peripheral circulation that is in the blood, but they also go through the lymphatics, you know, through the lymph nodes and, and, and before they, they enter the blood. Now, but then we know that in, 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 the, in the passage through the lymphatics, there's the severe attrition. You know, a lot of the parasites do not survive. They die, you know, but some do survive and do contribute uh, to, 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 to the infection and, of course, the transmission. And then we have the, the normal blood uh, circulation that is going through the liver. So you have some additional sites of transmission you know, that needs to be assessed and that needs to be targeted. And, and at this point, as we speak, there are no real indicators for targeting these. And that is a, a major problem. So the, the critics infections, as we mentioned, we have, especially in P. vivax, a huge biomass of the parasites within the spleen and the bone marrow, you know? And apart from that, all the cycle components that is starting from the, the, the sporozoids that undergo chizogony uh, in the liver to generate the merozoids, and then which then infect the RBCs, this entire process that, that are seen only in the uh, blood stages are seen in the spleen as well. So you can see the early, um, early cycle of the parasites as the ring stages, the trophozoids, and then again the merozoids that reinfect the red, red blood cells and sustain the cycle. So the spleen and then the bone marrow become a significant site or source of infection when there's no infection from outside, from mosquitoes. And this is really important that this can be assessed either in the form of uh, 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 you know, a kit or some detection mechanism that will allow us to see these cryptic infections. And then the, the other point is that, you know, it has been observed that these cryptic infections appear to contribute more to severe disease than what is known peripherally. You know, so, you know, the, the fact that, you know, individuals don't have any parasites in the blood that are visible does not mean that individuals are not sick, you know. This absolutely says that if there are cryptic infections that are not seen and they are being harbored by individuals, then this can contribute to morbidity within the community. So then it is important that you know, research is done to ensure that these cryptic infections, including the hypnosis, are targeted for elimination. Now we know that currently the only drugs that are available for targeting hypnozoids are the eight aminoquinolins and, and, and we know the uh, primaquine and then tafnoquine. And, and of course, that the link with the uh, GCPD deficiency that subjects that are GCP deficient can undergo hemolytic anemia and therefore need to be tested you know, before these are rolled out. Uh, we know also that currently WHO has indicated the use of low dose uh, primaquine you know, in, in a dosage of 0.5 milligram per kilogram body weight that will appear to minimize any side effects even when there's no testing for GCSPD. And that could be a, a very good prompter uh, for ensuring that the, the hypnozoids are targeted. But then the question remains as to the cryptic infections. Now, there is a huge conundrum. Uh, you know, conundrum here means that there, there's, an, there's a paradox, you know, with regards to how these parasites are able to enter these cryptic sites. Um, now we know that the, the entry point for these cryptic sites is the sinusoids. Now in, in, in general anatomy, we know that the sinusoids are aligned with macrophages, uh, you know, which should normally uh, detect any, any pathogens that are entering um, either the liver or the, the spleen or the bone marrow so that these are salvaged, you know, these are eaten up by the macrophages. But somehow, the, the, the macrophages that are lining the sinuses appear rather to aid in, in the infection process. And, and this, is a, this is a huge conundrum. Um, and as to how the parasites are able to escape and enter into these cryptic sites and stay there and go through the cycle. And I think this is a, in an important area for, for research and, and for bringing some understanding 
you know, so that this can be targeted, you know, for 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 destruction and elimination, either through use of monoclonal antibodies or vaccines or uh, whatever we, we know the, the scientific community to be able to uh, come up with. Uh, but this is a huge conundrum on the process of entry into these cryptic sites. So now the issue is, so how are the parasites able to develop? So the first question is, how do they enter into the cryptic sites? And the second question is, how are they able to develop are these cryptic sites, cryptic sites. Now there are no clear answers uh, yet. You know, uh, there are absolutely no clear answers. So then it again adds to the complexity of the life cycle and then the elimination strategies. You know, so here we are looking at: is there, for instance, are the cryptic sites seven also in the form of kypnozoids? You know, as we know it, do they just remain dormant and then come outside at some point, or they are just in there, go through the life cycle, enter the circulation, and then begin to re regenerate another cycle of infection. Now, the, normally we, we say that the hypnozoids that reactivate, uh, you know, the process is called relapses. In, and uh, and uh, is it possible that these cryptic sites also undergo relapses as we know it, you know, with regards to the hypnozoids? There are no answers to that at this point. Just a couple that I'll be mentioning. So, you now these hypnozoids, um, uh, you know, that we know already and you know, sustain relapses. You know, there are two forms of the hypnozoids. We have the temperate strains and then the tropical strains. You know, the temperate strains appear to have long activation periods. You know, so from the time of the primary infection, they get reactivated between six to twelve months. You know after the primary infection. And then with the uh, tropical strains, they have short activation periods between three to six weeks um, after the primary infection. And um, uh, whilst there, there's no certain reason why the reactivation occurs, uh, some, of the, um, some of the reasons that are given is that the, the reactivation depends on the volume of the sporozoids that are initially inoculated and when, how many of them are sustained, you know, at the time of trans, at the time of um, in transport, you know, into the either the liver tissues or the cryptic sites. So this may be depend on volume, or it may depend on a new infection by another plasmodium parasite. That are, you know, once a new infection goes on, the the, the dormant forms are reactivated, or some kind of inflammatory response to some kind of infection within an individual who has an infection or some other environmental factors like temperature, etc. So, so there are no clear indicators of how these dormant forms are activated. And that could be also for the cryptic infections. We nobody really knows how you know they cycle and how they 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 provide new supply of infection uh, within an individual who is infected. So so then we have a question: Can cryptic infections behave as hypnozymes? There are only a few reports, and I'll just mention one. And that report to is is on 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 the placenta. You know, there was one report, and this was not just a P vivax. There was a one report of a dormant PF form within the placenta of an individual. You know, so this raises the the question that I've been talking previously: Is it possible that all plasmodium species can give rise to dormant hypnozoids, but then in relative numbers. And, and what I mean by this is that, for instance, if we take P. vivax and P. ovale, these have defined hypnozoids, defined um, cryptic infections that we know reactivate at a certain intervals, whether within a temperate strain or within a tropical strain. So could it be that in PF, for instance, they could reactivate rather, but rather over a much, much longer period. And so these are not seen normally, that like we normally will be looking for. And, and this will apply for P. Maleri or P. Nolsi also. You know, so these are areas that brings new concepts that we, we have to begin to think about, you know, when we look at targeting species for malaria, malaria elimination. Uh, this means that particularly, in in well in East Asia and then in Africa, we, we can't use the same kind of uh, strategy. You know, in East Asia, while you are targeting P P vivax, 
you know, in Africa, they are targeting PF. But now we know that in African P vivax also exists there. So there has to be a worldwide discussion on how this new uh, information on the biology of the parasites can feed into elimination strategies so that countries, whether it's regional groups or whether it's in its individual um, you know, country groupings, they can then be properly informed as to how they have the, the planning, as to how the strategies that will be utilized for elimination can be developed. I think this is very crucial. So in PVIMAX, again, the another complexity is regards to asymptomatic infections. You know, as we said, you only look at what is available, you know, and then you 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 treat. Uh, and if normally, if there is no signs of infection, and active infection is not done normally done routinely. But of course, this is recommended in an elimination setting that active detection is done to 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 see those parasites that do not present symptomatically so that they can be eliminated. Now, in P5, vast greater than 70% of transmissions are done through asymptomatic infections. So this is a conundrum, another conundrum there, you know, another problem that needs proper assessment and then added to the complexity of properly looking at elimination strategies that should be uh, done across regional groups and then across specific countries. So now, to just summarize these challenges to elimination, how do we handle mosquitoes that potentially contribute to transmission at boundaries between countries when one country is at elimination and the other is not, or even when both countries are at, at elimination? How do you collaborate? How do you, you know, discuss, you know, to ensure that one can then, you know, set up a process that these mosquitoes can be detected and tracked? Again, how do we encourage or you know foster the research community to come up with tests to detect cryptic infections as well as to detect hypnozoids? You know that will be a serious part of the elimination agenda. And then strategies for testing and treating asymptomatic infections. Now, my suggestion here will be. Uh, to have sustained research in all malaria endemic countries, to understand the new list in the biology of the species, and then of course to have discussions, you know, on the global scale. And I think the st key stakeholders that need to initiate these discussions will be WHO, IBM, and then the funders. I mean, there has to be a, a way to bring, you know, you know, initiate some forum uh, across board, you know, and say that, well, these are these are realities. These are what we know and how do we then create the the global community agenda and knowledge base you know that will allow for effective use of funds uh, and ensure that elimination proceeds you know as all countries have now been encouraged to to set along the path of malaria elimination and then the second part the third part is to ensure that you know countries have a strategies for quick response mechanism uh, so that whenever there's a detection uh, there, there's a treatment, whether across border or whether uh, through an active case detection, whatever, whether it's a passive, you know, there has to be a quick response mechanism uh, that is put into place. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, uh, happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Isaac. And uh, you have uh, uh, summarized uh, and uh, informed us about cryptic infection in PV and PV uh, and uh, beautifully you have covered and uh, what I understood from your talk, the two keynote messages from your side uh, is the global dialogues or global discussion because of the heterogeneity in the uh, geographical distribution yeah. and the sustained research are the key message of your talk and uh, 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 if you allow, we can we can take some questions from the audience. I yes. I have some questions. Yes. Uh, so the first question is: uh, uh, Who is the major contributor in terms of asymptomatic infections? Is it uh, falciparum or vivax? It's vivax. Vivax has the major contribution with regards to asymptomatic infections. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
another question is ongoing treatment in plasmodium vivax uh, the is this enough to control the cryptic infection yes that's a very good question um and as i said we do not know if the current medication that we have i mean the eta aminoquinolones can clear cryptic infections it, it is not certain we, there's not enough data on that but we know that it does affect hypnozoids um you know to clear uh, but as to whether it can target all cryptic infections that is not and the, the data is not available at this point uh, you know to answer that okay uh, dr rahi would you like to ask the question or okay so i have uh, i have a question yes uh, in in low transmission settings a uh, lot of parasite diversity is not expected how do we differentiate between fresh infection and relapse exactly that is a good question so normally um the the trend is that when you are following up let's say if you are, there's a case and then one is following up the relapse usually happens after day 8 of a follow up you know so you have a primary infection and then if you were doing a longitudinal follow up the eight after the primary infection if there's a new report it's likely a relapse you know if the individual has not gone into an area where there's a reinfection if the individual is within his own community after the eight of the primary infection is the likelihood of a relapse okay i have another question some smear negative chills and regular parasite could be the malaria positive what's what's your opinion on this say it again the smear negative smear negative chills and regular parasite persist could be malaria positive yeah of course malaria if you have a smear negative it doesn't exclude you remember that it depends on the sensitivity of the test that you are using and in most labs the the is the sensitivity is based on either microscopy or rdts these are not sensitive enough you know in a malaria elimination setting where transmission is low and in low trans transmission setting we are looking at less than 10% and in very low less than 1% of transmission so this requires highly sensitive molecular techniques for detection either pcr or real time pcr you know so just saying that a slide is negative does not preclude that there's no infection okay so uh, i think uh, uh, we we don't have more questions and in, in interest of time as i told you we have some other scheduled meeting yes, yes. Uh, i would like to conclude this uh, wonderful session here and uh, from the uh, from indian council of medical research national institute of malaria research and malaria elimination research alliance uh i uh, thank you from bottom of my heart that you accepted our request and gave this wonderful talk and uh, i'm sure that uh, we'll be in touch and we'll see the possible collaboration if if we if there, absolutely if there is any chance yeah thanks okay. a lot and I really appreciate the invitation to be part of this thank you so much thank you so much you. for uh, the audience to joining us and yeah. we'll connect the next month with the new lecture thank you thank so you much, much. okay